Oh, uh, don't worry, it's okay. Don't worry, it's fine. Um, so, uh, like I said, we're going to talk about metabolic syndrome. Um, uh, look, we can't deny it. there's an obesity um, epidemic uh, worldwide, uh, which is resulting in a uh, fairly so great number of our patients being uh, obese, the ones who uh, present for surgery. Um, and the rising incidence of uh, obesity has also led to an increased um, prevalence of um, this distinct um, um, so metabolic um, syndrome, um, which is what we'll be talking about today. Uh, this, uh, I guess, was partly inspired by uh, one of the patients um, we had for an east size um, last week. And um, this was a case of um, uh, Miss so FCN. She's um, a young lady, a um, 29-year-old lady, who uh, presents for a total thyroidectomy. Um, her symptoms were um, only uh, sort of difficulty swallowing over the last few months uh, because of a large uh, multinodular goiter. Uh, but there's no retrosternal extension um, on CT scan. And there's no um, reported dyspnea either. She's um, clinically euthyroid. Uh, past medical history, she's had a lap call in 2006. Um, which is un, um, unremarkable. Uh, she, she's got type 2 diabetes, uh, which she takes Diabex for, and the hypertension, which she takes um, Olmitec. Uh, Pre-anesthetic assessment, um, in, uh, she came in through um, pre-admission clinic um, as well. Um, her BMI is 58, um, her weight's about 179 kilos, uh, and she's already lost about 20 kilos um, by this stage. Um, height, 175 um, centimeters. Uh, BP is reasonably well controlled. 130 and 89, uh, but as you can see her um, sort of um, glucose level isn't, um, HbA1c was 0.3% on um, in pre-admission clinic. And her um, BSL was 15 uh, in uh, the pre-admission clinic as well. Air airway assessment wasn't too bad though. Uh, she had a mount patty of one uh, and the previous scheduled one laryngoscopy and uh, the rest of her examination uh, was, uh, was normal. So we'll go back to the, um, the case, this case at the um, end of the tour. Um, so going back to uh, the um, uh, metabolic um, syndrome, um, so it, the metabolic syndrome is formally defined as a, um, uh, a syndrome with a specific um, truncal distribution of um, adipose tissue, and this is um, associated with um, insulin resistance and hyperglycemia, uh, decreased um, HDL levels, elevated um, triglycerides, and, uh, and hypertension. Um, so unlike uh, morbid obesity, um, which most definitions require BMI greater than um, 35, uh, metabolic syndrome uh, doesn't. So you can have, um, um, so only moderate obesity um, is required uh, in most cases, uh, or a specific distribution of the, uh, of the um, adipose tissue, which is mainly um, so truncal in origin. Um, so metabolic syndrome um, has been sort of gaining more sort of prominence in the last uh, 20 years or so. Uh, but it's been, uh, it's been known to as early as about 90 years ago. Um, so as you can see, it's had a lot of, um, sort of aliases over the years. Uh, from back in 1923, um, hypertension, hypoglycemia, hyperuricemic syndrome, um, to so being known as syndrome of um, affluence in, uh, in the 1960s. Um, and um, I think Gerard Reven in 1988 um, coined the term syndrome X, which is uh, I think what we um, so I've heard of most of the time, uh, and also insulin resistance syndrome. Um, chaos has been coined by uh, an Australian, um, uh, Australian by the name of Gale in 1998, and just stands for um, coronary artery disease, hypertension, atherosclerosis, obesity, and stroke. Uh, there's also a similar condition, uh, interestingly, in uh, overweight horses, and that's called uh, an equine metabolic syndrome. Uh, but whether the um, etiology is the same, we're, we're not quite sure. So um, the uh, uh, diagnostic criteria for uh, metabolic syndrome, um, so during the past few years, several um, international organizations uh, have tried to form a uh, reference context for um, what should be included under the terms of uh, metabolic syndrome, and they propose uh, various definitions. Uh, so the three most commonly used ones are so the World Health Organization, uh, the NCEP, which stands for National Cholesterol Education Program, Adult Treatment Panel and the um, IDF, uh, International Diabetes Federation. So as you can see, uh, a lot of the um, essential criteria that they um, um, that uh, that they need to um, have the diagnosis of metabolic syndrome is different for all three, and not one. They've got some similarities, but um, also quite a fair few differences. Um, diabetes is one of the essential criteria for the end of food definition. Uh, whereas uh, so waist circumference is an essential criteria for um, the International Diabetes Federation. 
There's also differences in um, so hypertension, their um, um, what they um, describe as being so so having high blood pressure. Uh, so between the WHO definition and the um, NSAID. Um, so like we've seen, I think diagnostic um, the diagnosis rests not on any specific tests, uh, but whether they meet these um, sort of predefined um, criteria. <coughs> But as you can see, also the, um, the definition emphasizes more on the um, um, central obesity, which is the um, the waist circumference or the waist to hip ratio. <coughs> so the um, the pathophysiology of uh, the metabolic syndrome uh, is still largely unknown. Um, whether it arises as a uh, interactive um, so sort of consequence of the underlying components, or whether additional environmental genetic conditions are involved, is also unknown. Um, and studies have found that there's uh, potentially um, so a genetic and an environmental component to the, um, to the syndrome itself. Um, twin studies have been fairly uh, inconclusive. Um, some um, twin studies have showed a fairly strong concordance for some of the uh, syndrome components, um, such as glucose intolerance, um, obesity, and um, um, a low HDL, uh, but weaker um, heritability estimates for others, such as um, adipose distribution. And, um, and triglyceride levels. And the um, uh, individual components such as um, uh, disability, uh, obesity, and hypertension also have, um, clearly have both um, so environmental and genetic um, predispositions. Predisposition, um, and the, uh, the best current hypothesis that we have at the moment is that the, um, um, the adipose tissue um, that accumulates um, um, in the trunks um, were unlike non-truncal fat in that um, they're metabolically active and that they uh, secrete um, pro-inflammatory adipocytokines, uh, which may increase um, inflammation and enhance um, insulin resistance. So, um, yeah, basically adipose tissue is an active uh, metabolic and um, immunologic endocrine organ in these patients. Um, so how common is um, uh, the uh, metabolic syndrome? Um, Obesity rates vary um, geographically, um, as, as, you know, as you're aware, and um, so the, um, um, the prevalence of metabolic syndrome will vary as well based on um, these rates. Um, there's um, so a couple of reasonably big studies. Um, there's a French study which found prevalence of about 23%, uh, with the highest risk of death um, associated with a combination of increased waist size, um, hyperglycemia, and, and uh, high... Um, um, like the elevated triglycerides. Uh, in the German study, they, they had about 36,000 subjects, and the, uh, the most common presentation was uh, an increased waist size, hypertension, and um, glucose intolerance. And the highest risk of MI was uh, also high triglycerides, low HDL, and glucose intolerance with hypertension as well. <coughs> um, most of the studies um, so far to date have um, concentrated on uh, cardiothoracic um, patients. Um, so um, I think there was um, one study which found 49% uh, of um, patients who um, were undergoing um, cardiothoracic surgery met the criteria for metabolic syndrome. Um, there's also, also been a very strong link to um, a lot of some of the cancers, um, colorectal cancer, prostate, uh, endometrial bladder, and breast cancer. Uh, and studies in orthopedics have shown a poor outcome as well for um, um, hip and knee surgery. So, like I said, a lot of studies have shown um, so fairly poor outcomes in some um, patients with um, metabolic syndrome who um, have um, surgery. And um, again, these are mainly in um, so cardiothoracic patients. Um, one study showed a 2.5% 2, 2 increase in mortality in non-diabetics who have a um, bypass surgery. Uh, and that study showed high risk of graft failure. And the other one showed high tenure mortality in uh, non-diabetics um, undergoing um, bypass. <coughs> Um, one of the largest uh, retros retrospective study to date, uh, reviewing data from over 300,000 patients, um, is um, so one that's come from the uh, American College of Surgeons database, and they show, show a two-fold increase in mortality and a uh, three to seven-fold increase risk of uh, acute renal failure in patients with um, obesity, hypertension, and diabetes. So. Um, what are the um, so anesthetic implications of, um, of this um, metabolic syndrome? Um, the five uh, most common um, comorbidities with uh, metabolic syndrome are insulin resistance, 
uh, sleep apnea, uh, coronary artery disease, and uh, congestive heart failure, pulmonary disease, and um, DVT. Um, so I think the next few, just few slides will just look at the, um, the current approaches to um, the preoperative um, evaluation and treatment of, um, of these five um, common comorbidities with um, metabolic syndrome. So the first one is um, insulin resistance. Um, insulin resistance um, and consequently um, hyperglycemia are core findings in our metabolic syndrome. Um, the uh, metabolic consequence of insulin resistance results in uh, a progressive cycle of hyperglycemia, uh, dyslipidemia, endothelial dysfunction, inflammation, and, uh, and atherosclerosis. Um, and also get uh, sort of progressive um, fatty um, deposition in the um, islet cells. Uh, and so this progressively reduces the um, synthetic reserve, and over time this results in type 2 diabetes. So um, the main studies on um, sort of hyperglycemia and surgery have been um, some of them have been on um, the neurosurgical patients, and they've, um, some studies have shown um, a poor outcome uh, with poorly controlled diabetes in um, neurosurgical aneurysm repair. Uh, and in the um, sort of cardiothoracic um, surgery realm, uh, they found a, uh, an increased um, sort of sternal wound infection um, in these patients. Uh, but unfortunately, um, conclusive data on um, uh, preoperative um, glucose um, threshold um, for case cancellation due to unacceptable um, risks are still lacking. Um, and um, similarly, um, so data to support a, a specific um, glucose range you have to maintain intraoperatively is still lacking as well. <coughs> and um, this was shown in a uh, so recent Cochrane review in uh, 2009, um, looking at uh, preoperative um, glycemic control regimens for, for preventing surgical site infections in adults. So th really, this poses um, two, two questions for the anesthetist. Um, should elective surgery be postponed? if a uh, sufficiently high preoperative glucose level exists? And um, secondly, should a target glucose level exist for um, intraoperatively and postoperative management? Um, with the, the first um, question, fortunately, again, no consensus, consensus exists on a uh, universally accepted threshold uh, on glucose level. Um, some studies have shown so HbA1c greater than 6% um, in uh, vascular surgery patients um, show they are uh, uh, a poor outcome, but some studies showed otherwise. And again, uh, in terms of uh, maintaining a, uh, a tight glucose control intraoperatively and postoperative management, um, there hasn't been any um, some concrete evidence as well uh, in that uh, in that field. And um, some studies have found that uh, maintaining a very tight glucose control uh, intraoperatively have led to um, sort of a lot of hypoglycemic episodes uh, postoperatively. <coughs> And I think there's been a, um, um, a recent study in, uh, in ICU that's been out as well um, on uh, maintaining um, a tight glucose control in uh, intensive care patients. And again, um, that didn't show any, uh, any clear benefit for ICU patients. And there was, a, uh, I think, an Australian study as well, which was recently published in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine. <coughs> so um, the um, next common mobility is um, sleep apnea. And um, a lot of studies have shown the increased prevalence um, of sleep apnea with um, metabolic syndrome. And, and this clearly um, complicates um, um, anesthetic, um, <coughs> anesthetic management. Um, on top of the, um, sort of the increase in the incidence of um, hypertension and coronary artery disease with um, uh, sleep apnea, you also get um, potential for air increased risk of airway obstruction and, uh, and depressed respiratory drive. Um, so obviously some of the challenges um, that we are faced with uh, with sleep apnea is um, airway management, uh, post-operative pain control, and, uh, and discharge after day case surgery, uh, especially um, since we're moving more towards um, day, day uh, surgery cases um, at, the, at the present time. Uh, the other problem with uh, sleep apnea is the um, patients that are quite unlikely to carry their diagnosis of sleep apnea unless uh, they're specifically asked um, so uh, I think there's been um, uh, a preoperative um, screening questionnaire called the um, Stop Questionnaire, Stop Bang Questionnaire, uh, which um, have a fairly um, so sort of high sensitivity and uh, negative predictive value uh, for moderate to um, severe obstructive sleep apnea. Um, 
And um, I'll just show you the um, questionnaire. This is the um, Stop Bang Around questionnaire, which has been used, um, I think, in America. Um, so it basically um, asks questions on uh, question to patients regarding their snoring, how tired they are, um, where did anyone's observed them um, snoring uh, when they were asleep, and uh, what the blood pressure is. The, uh, the um, bang portion of the um, stop bang questionnaire um, increases the um, sensitivity and the um, negative predicted value um, of the uh, questionnaire. Um, for severe uh, sleep apnea, it's up to 100%. So and again, they asked about, they looked at um, uh, to the BMI, the age of the patient, uh, the next circumference, and the uh, gender of the patient. Um, and this is the, uh, um, the parameters. Um, so AHI, the um, apnop apnea hypopnea index uh, of greater than five, um, so mild sleep apnea, moderate sleep apnea, and severe sleep apnea. As you can see, I think the um, sensitivity, sensitivity um, uh, greatly increases um, with the um, stop bank questionnaire, but even just with the um, stop questionnaire itself, it's still about 80%. So uh, diagnostic tests for uh, sleep apnea. The um, definitive um, diagnose, diagnostic test is um, obviously overnight um, polysomnograph or sleep study. But unfortunately, that's fairly time consuming, um, labor intensive, uh, expensive, and uh, quite difficult to obtain sometimes. And um, delaying surgery, it's probably not warranted just to get uh, a confirmation of sleep apnea. Um, studies have also found that there's uh, a high preoperative sc screening score of um, sleep apnea plus recurrent apnea, so desaturations um, immediately post-op um, equates to a fairly high risk of um, post-op respiratory events uh, with an odds ratio of about 21. So uh, I mean, knowing this, it may actually, um, uh, you may want to uh, admit the patient if um, these were to happen to so a particular patient that you've been used on any given day. So um, what um, strategies can we employ to, um, to reduce uh, intraoperative and uh, postoperative um, risk of complications for um, patients with sleep apnea? Unfortunately, um, these um, strategies are a few. Um, and um, like weight loss is one, but uh, significant weight, lo weight loss is unlikely. Um, surgical interventions, um, again, they have a fairly um, limited utility in a lot of the um, studies of sleep apnea. Um, nasal mass um, CPAP is quite effective um, in chronic management of um, sleep apnea. And uh, studies have shown a, uh, a decrease in pharyngeal size um, after about 46 weeks or four to six weeks of um, CPAP. But um, so evidence um, that it reduces post-op complications is still quite limited. Um, and also so careful um, observations and um, so limited use of opioids and um, sedatives and um, hospital and admission and the post-op um, CPAP have all been um, advocated. But again, um, there's no um, so studies looking at um, um, how useful these are in uh, preventing um, post-op um, complications. Um, the next um, comorbidity is um, coronary artery disease and uh, congestive heart failure. This is probably um, the one um, aspect of um, uh, the metabolic syndrome where there's been uh, so a lot more studies. Um, The um, current evidence on um, um, coronary artery disease and uh, congestive heart failure, um, metabolic syndrome patients um, uh, are at high risk of uh, coronary artery disease and uh, congestive heart failure. And uh, in addition to the, uh, the risks uh, induced by the uh, component conditions such as hypertension, hypoglycemia, dyslipidemia, the um, increased um, um, adiponectin in uh, coronary calcium deposits also play a role uh, in these patients. Um, so again, studies have been mainly in um, so cardiothoracic um, surgery patients. In, uh, in a recent study uh, by, by Constantinou, uh, they found so a fairly um, high risk of um, coronary artery disease uh, in patients who meet the criteria for uh, metabolic syndrome. We've also found an increased risk of uh, congestive heart failure in, um, uh, in these particular patients. Um, this uh, study, the um, Third National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, I think this was done in the, um, 19, from 1988 to 1994, uh, and this was on a survey of about um, 5,000 patients, um, and I think they found odds ratio about 1.8 um, with, um, for patients with metabolic syndrome developing um, congestive heart failure. 
so there is a link, uh, but um, whether that's due to the, uh, the increased cardiac output for um, obesity, uh, whether it's due to sleep apnea, uh, pulmonary hypertension, or, or the syndrome itself, uh, unfortunately, again, um, there's no studies um, to find uh, what the major link is. So, um, in light of the, uh, the increase um, incidence um, of, those, uh, of both congestive heart failure and coronary artery disease uh, in metabolic syndrome patients, um, how should we um, um, approach the, um, the risk um, stratification for surgery? Uh, at the moment, the, uh, the risk um, stratification uh, for coronary artery disease um, should proceed as recommended by the um, ACC AHA guidelines. Um, and current evidence supports the uh, contention that because um, little uh, coronary artery disease risk accrues for metabolic syndrome versus its um, uh, individual components, um, evaluating the um, cumulative um, coronary artery disease risk from each component condition is, uh, is fairly reasonable. Um, data supporting uh, preoperative um, revascularization uh, in non-cardiac surgery have been um, uh, has been an option in the past, but um, but there hasn't been any uh, any data supporting that. So uh, medical management um, has been recommended um, um, to date. Uh, a lot of studies have looked at um, whether um, aspirin, statins, or um, ACE inhibitors have to be continued um, um, perioperatively. Um, and uh, one study looking at aspirin um, uh, showed that even though there's an increased risk of um, perioperative bleeding, um, it also showed a high risk of um, uh, cardiac uh, disease uh, to benefit um, patients with a high risk of cardiac disease. Uh, and they thought that this may be due to the, uh, the decrease in the uh, inflammation and the hypercoagulability uh, of, uh, of these patients. Um, there's been uh, more studies that, that have come out recently in terms of um, statin use. Um, I think Colhoun uh, et al. Uh, with the, uh, the CARD study, which was published in the, uh, the Lancet uh, 2004, um, they look at the um, primary prevention of um, cardiovascular disease and uh, atorvastatin in type 2 diabetics. Um, <clears throat> and Schutten et al. Uh, is, has been the first major uh, prospective study. Uh, this was, I think this was done in um, the, um, Denmark um, to demonstrate uh, improve um, perioperative um, outcomes in patients randomized to um, fluvastatin or atorvastatin with a 5.3% um, absolute risk reduction of death from uh, cardiovascular causes. Uh, withdrawal of stat statins uh, in the um, perioperative um, period also appears to be uh, associated with um, adverse outcomes. Um, but again, I think no clinical trials have addressed uh, the use of statins in patients with uh, metabolic uh, syndrome itself. Uh, similarly with, uh, with ACE inhibitors, uh, the SMILE study came out in 2008, uh, and this showed uh, less early in uh, one-year mortality um, after, after MI with uh, zoftenopril, uh, but they predispose to uh, intraoperative um, hypertension, so um, uh, their use have to, have to be um, carefully weighed against the, um, uh, the risk and the um, benefits. Uh, and beta blockers is which what um, someone, one of the uh, medications that we're probably more um, uh, familiar with. Um, to date, uh, uh, the data on beta blockers have been fairly variable as well. Uh, I think Mangano and uh, I think Fordimans uh, reported uh, improved outcomes in high-risk patients, but we know from the end of the study that uh, it doesn't, uh, it failed to demonstrate any improved outcomes. Um, therefore, uh, post-operative, um, uh, so beta blockade can only, um, perioperative beta blockade can only be recommended for patients already receiving this therapy and should not be stopped um, um, secondary to, um, just to avoid withdrawal uh, from these patients. Uh, the only recommendation that I can find in terms of uh, post-operative management on beta blockers and statins is uh, for them to be restarted promptly um, after um, any operation. Um, in terms of uh, pulmonary disease, uh, patients with uh, metabolic syndrome have an increased risk of, um, sort of having restrictive lung disease. Uh, pulmonary hypertension probably due to the uh, associated sleep apnea or DVT. Um, pulmonary edema, uh, perhaps due to uh, congestive heart failure. Uh, or repeated negative pressure events and uh, post-operative um, atelectasis. Um, there's uh, no test that's been um, useful um, in terms of um, um, adding to the um, operative management of, uh, of these patients. Um, some, pa some 
uh, papers that advocated uh, pulmonary function tests, but it's unlikely to change the um, restric restrictive lung disease that the patients already have. Um, chest x-ray and ABG likewise is unlikely to change um, your management during the um, non-operation. So uh, what are the strategies to reduce um, atelectasis? Um, uh, and a lot of these um, strategies have been advocated in, in some papers, um, so pre oxygenation with, uh, with uh, CPAP. Um, some, there's been a lot of studies on, uh, on pre oxygenated patients uh, with CPAP. Some of them have looked at um, um, doing this with, uh, I think, 8 cent centimeters of water versus um, 10 versus 5. Um, and um, they found that um, pre oxygenating with um, 10 centimeters of water of, C, um, of CPAP uh, prior to uh, induction um, showed a, a better outcome at the end of the operation. Uh, there's less uh, desaturation on extubation and uh, so upon returning to, uh, to recovery. Uh, recruitment maneuvers, again, uh, there's been a few studies looking at recruitment maneuvers um, and um, one particular study looked at um, um, doing a volume recruitment for about seven to eight seconds and, uh, and then putting patients on, um, on the PEEP of um, 10 um, back on the machine. And again, that's been found to have the, um, the best outcome uh, as opposed to so doing recruitment maneuver and then putting them back on the machine with um, zero PEEP. Um, reverse the uh, positioning uh, during the surgery and uh, extubation in the um, semi-recumbent position have been advocated as well. Uh, and likewise with uh, post-extubation um, um, CPAP. Um, studies that looked at um, post-extubation um, CPAP uh, essentially put the patients directly back onto the CPAP machine on extubation uh, as opposed to um, so waiting until um, any signs and symptoms of um, atelectasis develops. And that was the only um, um, maneuver that actually helped these, uh, these particular patients. Uh, in terms of um, DVT, uh, clinical studies have confirmed a predisposition, predisposition to, uh, to DVT. Um, so in, in the case control study, uh, I think um, Ageno um, found um, a NALS ratio of 1.94 with um, DVT and metabolic syndrome. Uh, and I think Gandhi had a, did a retrospective study which showed a um, fourfold increase in the, uh, the risk with metabolic syndrome and likewise, likewise with um, Stefan. So all three studies showed a fairly strong, um, sort of strong link with, between DVT and uh, metabolic syndrome. Um, the reason of which I'm still not quite sure, I think they still think it's probably due to the, um, uh, the adipose tissue with the uh, increase in inflammation um, causing um, DVT. Unfortunately, not quite sure about that. Um, so the current recommendation uh, with uh, DVT, um, unfortunately, again, um, there's um, no outcome um, data that exists to guide the uh, preoperative uh, management of um, hypercoagulability in uh, metabolic syndrome. Um, but because of the, uh, the high likelihood and uh, the greater impact that um, uh, a preoperative PE uh, will have in these patients who might really have some cardiac or um, pulmonary dysfunction, a very careful uh, preoperative um, evaluation uh, should be performed. Um, and there's been um, so insufficient data to date to recommend um, any um, preoperative um, venous, venous imaging unless there's um, evidence uh, on history of physical exam. If there's a confirmed DVT, uh, I think they recommend delaying surgery for at least one month and uh, systemically um, anticoagulating the um, patient. If the surgery can't be delayed, then um, uh, a prophylactic IVC filter um, can be considered. Um, sorry, the, the last part is, uh, I think it's just saying, the uh, uh, preoperative um, IVC filter um, with no documented DVT has been advocated for, uh, for gastric bypass patients. Uh, and these uh, patients um, have to have so, uh, known venous stasis, uh, a BMI greater than 60, uh, truncal obesity and uh, obesity hyperventilation syndrome. Uh, and these, it's only for these patients that they've actually found a um, uh, a clear benefit of um, putting an IVC filter in. So, uh, knowing, uh, knowing the, um, the increased risk of uh, metabolic syndrome with um, a lot of the um, surgical procedures that's, uh, that's performed, um, what are the um, strategies for, um, that we can employ to reduce the, um, the risk for these patients? Um, it's probably not in our realm, um, but Less invasive um, surgical ap approaches have been um, advocated for some of these patients, so the endoscopic, uh, laparoscopic, and robotic procedures. 
um, the, uh, the benefits of um, doing it um, this way include um, reduce inflammation, improve um, post-op pain and perhaps some um, technical ease uh, for these patients. Um, in terms of uh, gastric bypass, uh, should gastric bypass be uh, performed uh, as part of a preoperative um, risk reduction? Um, gastric bypass has been the, uh, the most um, statistically uh, successful treatment for severe obesity. Uh, and existing data support um, an ability to improve all, comp all components of uh, metabolic syndrome and some even having a, uh, a cure rate of about 90%. But the, and the question we have to ask ourselves is that is the um, cumulative mo morbidity uh, of undergoing a gastric bypass um, surgery less than the uh, actual procedure alone? So um, in, um, in conclusion, um, many challenges um, sort of face in Easter's with these particular patients, uh, patients with uh, metabolic syndrome. Um, what's even more challenging is that it's um, incompletely understood, uh, which make it sort of a bit harder to, um, um, uh, to diagnose and, uh, and to treat. Um, and there's no specific tests uh, for, uh, for the metabolic syndrome. So and different combinations um, will give um, different um, perioperative risks and uh, at the moment, there's uh, fairly um, scarce um, data on uh, what the best practice is in, uh, in dealing with these patients. And uh, as we've said before, we have a, very, a growing obesity epidemic, and, um, and that's going to, uh, and we're going to be faced with um, some more patients with, the, uh, with this metabolic syndrome. So I guess more studies will need to be done on, uh, on this um, aspect of medicine. An exhaustive uh, coverage of the topic. Does, does anyone have any questions or comments in relation to that? Alan, you must have seen an increase in this over years, have you? Well, there is a Look, we ten past eight. We may uh, finish it there and everybody get off and do their work for the day. Thank you very much, Stanley. Thanks a lot. Thanks.